I'm back with comedian and actress Margaret Cho, and also joining us is Jennifer Posner, founder and executive director of Women in Media and News. So we talked before the break about kids posting these Am I Pretty videos, and something is still bothering me, and it really is about sort of adults perpetuating the cycle. I want to bring you in a little bit, Jen, because I know a lot of your work has been around images of women in the media, and I don't want to just say, oh, um, you know, skinny images are bad, sexist images are bad. It would help us to, to understand sort of the complexity here. Well, there is, I'm so glad that you want to know about complexity because we so often whitewash that, right? It's a continuum. So if girls are being told and adult women are being told from newspapers, billboards, magazines, TV shows, um, everything from media coverage focusing on female politicians' hair and their suits and their child rearing techniques to reality shows that tell girls that are even Madison Avenue approved style bodies that they're too short, too tall, too thin, not thin enough, um, not good enough, that they need to relax their hair if it's kinky, all of that, then girls and adult women are finding the message that their bodies and their appearance are their only source of power and their only route to acceptance. And so then, in a multi-saturated media age, where do young girls go for validation in response to that? They think they're making their own little reality shows on YouTube and they're looking for you know, some sort of positive response. But what you get is this immense amount of harassment and we don't, it, when you put yourself out there like that on the internet, what we need instead of America's next top model is, you know, America's next top young leader. If yeah. we had more messages like that. But 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 then, you know, it, it's interesting to hear you say next top leader, because one of my favorite things that you do, Margaret, is the ways in which you play powerful men. Um, so, it's you know, it's, it's actually some of my, my most uh, enjoyable parts of your work is you as Che Guevara, you as Kim Jong-il, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and so I'm wondering about that sort of, it, it's, a, it's a different form. You know, we, we often see sort of men cross dressing into women as less powerful. That's mm -hmm. hysterical, right? Ah, oh, that's, that's like core comedic political behavior. Yeah. But I'm wondering about this kind of putting on male privilege and male power as part of what you're doing. Oh, it's, it is extremely empowering, I think, you know, because then you just kind of have to like just embody the strength and you have to like leave behind all of the sort of feminine things like spend like for me to play a man is so easy like I don't have to spend any time in the makeup chair no makeup no spanks no spanks, no spanks right. actually a fat suit yeah right right, right. the other right the right. other way the other way which is a uh, really fun um but I've also worn a fat suit to play a woman and I remember going on set and you know, everybody really ignoring me because I was really hungry and I was eating by the table like craft service table and people were like walking away what and do do? scared what do do? like scared yeah. like so a, a, right because a big man's body is a powerful presence but a big woman's body is something we want to pretend we're not even seeing. yeah and scared to be around because like oh my god she's eating and she doesn't care she's not trying to hide the fact that she's eating right and yet and uh, one of the moments that i thought was so horrible where beauty and body image and, and food and all that is concerned in um, reality TV after about a decade of The Bachelor and all of these shows telling um, women that basically love is only for skinny white women, they finally roll out the same producers who brought us The Bachelor and Who Wants to Marry a Multimillionaire brought out More to Love, which was the sort of supposedly the fatchelor is what they, they, oh, um, uh -huh. they right. subtitled it for inside. Um, and they said it was going to be about larger size women having a chance for romance like the rest of us as if there's a yeah the right. us versus but, them. But, but of course it's all really just about them being fat and right. needing to be and, not and the way they're they, just normal size and the way yeah. they did it was by having instead of cocktail parties like on the bachelor they they rolled out meat on a stick uh -huh. and pizzas at the mm -hmm. cocktail party cuz of course all larger women can do is stuff their face <laughs> with meat on a stick right now, i want to you know we're talking a lot about women here i want to talk also a little bit about the stereotypes that associate around around race and ethnic identity. We were talking a little bit of Lynn's sanity before. Uh, Margaret, I know you wanted to, to weigh in on that a bit. Well, you know, I think there's a lot of racist coverage of, about Jeremy Lynn, but I don't think that people or journalists are meaning to be racist, but they're just not used to talking about Asian Americans. I mean, the only experience they have, you know, with us is they just want us to take their order. They don't really know, like, I mean, even in, like, menus, right. like, for, yeah. like, takeout Chinese, they don't have you order by the name of the dish because it's too hard. They have to... <laughs> 
give you a number, number. so that yeah. we could uh, we could just have a number, you know. And this whole like so idea. So is this the inability to see Jeremy Linden for some anything other than some sort of model minority? I think the... people are so excited about his presence. They want to write about him and talk about him. But the fact that Asian American men have been so invisible mm -hmm. for forever that you know it, it's like how do we talk about this without being racist? All we have is stereotypes. That's all we have. Yeah, you know, and on a journalistic level, um, the call to or the reversion to stereotype as the go-to is really anti-journalistic ethics, right? But it's what they do. It's what we have in this climate, right? Um, at Women's Voices, the group blog of Women in Media News, we had a contributor, Joanna Chu, wrote a piece about racist media coverage of Jeremy Lin and looked at every single, <laughs> tons of outlets, and it was all the same sort of narratives. It was um, looking at, even during the sports reporting, talking about him as an academic, ex, you know, ex excelling in academics while he's, you know, really excelling on the field. You don't have that court on the court. I'm sorry. Did I say <laughs> See, clearly, I should not be talking about sports. I can talk about the journalistic That's right, process. That's right. Ethics of it. I should. Yeah. Speaking of uh, speaking of you talking about journalistic process, I, I'm going to take a, a, a moment of, of host privilege here because I need a little therapy, Margaret, and I'm hoping perhaps you can provide some. I was thinking a lot as I was reading up for our interview about the sense that you had of your voice getting constrained mm -hmm. um, in uh, in your uh, original network shift. I love the Drop Dead Diva, but in, in the uh, an, an American uh, girl. Mm -hmm. And, you know, honestly, Jen made me very nervous. She wrote this really lovely piece about this show starting, but in it, she said something like, can the Melissa Harris Perry show um, remove race and gender blinders from cable news? Not Which, my headline. Yes, no, 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 I know. It's not your headline. But, <laughs> but it felt like a lot. And so I guess I'm literally yeah. asking for a, like a therapy pause here, mm -hmm. a, a bit of advice about what does it mean to be women in media, not just to sort of talk about how the media does it wrong, but how do we preserve some sense of authenticity and voice while trying to build audience? Well, I think um, we don't know because we're inventing it as we go along. You know, that's yeah. the thing is that we have to invent it as we go along. And our authenticity is everything we do and say. That is authentic. And to question or seek authenticity is to go, how am I somehow not real? I mean, do, do white people ask if they're authentic? No. <laughs> has, has, well, people are asking if Mitt Romney is authentic, but it's because well, that's very different. That's because of his hair. But that has nothing to do with <laughs> with what he, you know, he what he would feel would be right. different from what we would feel. I mean, I always felt really like I've got to invent it because I've never seen anything like myself mm -hmm. going. But my my situation is my father was deported when I was born, and so the, my family's so terrified that it would happen again. And so I'm the only member of my family to have been born in America. So my mother would always push me forward, like she's white. So I grew up thinking that I was white and believing it because my eyes are in my head and looking this Out. way. So I, from this, I look white. <laughs> and so I just go that. That's how I do it. That's, that's how I go with it. It's a fascinating way of, of sort of thinking about that identity question. We're not looking at ourselves, right? We're looking out of ourselves. Yes. So yeah. you can think anything. Yeah. That's yeah. And I want to say, first of all, sorry for the headline, not my choice. <laughs> no, I know, you have uh, a lot of pressure. What, what I had wanted to call it was, uh, I think, sister pundit journalist, something like that, playing off your book. But no, what the point with that article was that you're already doing it. By the fact that this show exists as a first, the first you know, progressive black feminist hosting a cable news outlet show that is the equivalent to an O'Reilly type show and bringing on a diversity of guests and doing a diversity of subject matter that you don't see elsewhere. That is the barriers being broken right there. So. The, the episode, you, the segment you did on Biggie yesterday no, with the guests. No more MHP love. No more okay. MHP love. Okay. <laughs> Margaret, I appreciate so much you taking the time to come in part because what I love about the work you do is connecting culture and politics and um, and activism and all of those things. And Jen, honestly, I was thrilled to have you at the table for so many of the same reasons, because I think that if there is an authentic way in which women often express ourselves is that we're not segmented, right? Our work is doing all of these different things at the same time. Mm -hmm. So thanks, I really appreciate it. Now, Margaret is not leaving. Jen, you're heading off for today, but we're gonna stay with us and talk some more policy as we keep going. Right. Thank Excellent. you, coming up. Unemployment numbers released Friday seem like good news, but there are recent figures.